Hi, everyone, and welcome to another recorded lecture from AMP1. Uh, today, we'll talk about Chapter 11, which is Muscle Tissue and Physiology. So before you begin, I'd like to recommend you watch two different videos. Um, one is the crash course video that's actually contained in this PowerPoint. Um, the other is another video on the overview of muscle contraction and muscle structure. Um, so that's a good place to start before you watch this lecture and after you watch the lecture. So this is that crash course video. Um, very helpful Romeo overview. I highly recommend watching that again before you even go any further. So let's just take a step back and review what we already learned um, from chapter 10. We know that muscles are kind of like bundles of ropes that are all bound together. Um, we said a single muscle cell is a muscle fiber. So a muscle fiber is one single cell. And those cells are wrapped together in bundles called fascicles. So a fascicle is a bundle of muscle fibers. Um, we said that muscles can be anchored to the skeleton, to bones through tendons, tendons. And those are made out of dense regular connective tissue. And there's this coating on the outside of muscles, right, that's made of dense irregular connective tissue um, that are, that's epimysium, as we'll soon see. So endomysium is the deepest compartment. So this is the endomysium over here shown in pink. That's what nourishes the each and every muscle fiber. So that's a loose connective tissue that has some space for blood vessels um, and blood capillaries to go through. The perimysium is what surrounds each fascicle. So the perimysium is around each fascicle. The epimysium is around the bundle of fascicles that make up a muscle compartment. So the epimysium is almost continuous with the fascia, which we said are these broad sheets of uh, dense, regular, dense, irregular connective tissue um, that provides structure and groups all these fascicles together so they could all contract in unison. So it's a good time to review this from last lecture. So there's this hierarchy and it gets a little complicated. So it's helpful to write it down. Uh, a muscle we said is broken down into fascicles, which are bundles of muscle fibers, but muscle fibers can also be broken down. So within a muscle fiber, we have myofibrils, which are bundles of myofilaments. So again, you have to keep that um, in check. So there's a couple of different diagrams I'll refer to. This is one of them. So again, this is the muscle that has bundles of fascicles, right? This is a fascicle bundle. And what a fascicle is, it's a, collect it's a bundle of muscle fibers. So let's zoom into this fascicle. This whole thing is a fascicle. We'll zoom in. This is a fascicle again. And here we have each individual one of these. This is a muscle fiber. This is a muscle fiber. This is a muscle fiber. So this is a muscle fiber that we're going to zoom into now. And within this muscle fiber, you have myofibrils. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven myofibrils shown in this myofiber. And within each myofibril, there are hundreds of myofilaments. So let's do uh, talk about this step by step. We said a muscle is composed of bundles which are fascicles of tightly packed, long parallel cells, muscle fibers, right? So muscles are composed of fascicles of fibers. Um, they are supplied with nerves and blood vessels for nourishment and stimulation. And each muscle is enclosed in epimysium and fascia that separate it from neighboring cells. All right. And of course, tendons would then attach that entire muscle to a bone. So now let's zoom in and on this muscle and look at the fascicles. So this is a fascicle. This is a fascicle. And that's a bundle of muscle fibers within a muscle. And these are again supplied by nerves and blood vessels. And each fascicle is enclosed in perimysium, 
perimysium. So this whole thing is a muscle fascicle, and each fascicle is coated with a perimysium that separates it from neighboring fascicles. So we know that fascicles contain fibers, and a muscle fiber is a single muscle cell. They're about the diameter of a hair. Um, they're very elongated and slender. So now let's zoom in to one of these muscle fibers. This is a muscle fiber. It does not look like a normal cell. The cytoplasm of a muscle fiber is called the sarcoplasm. So sarco is the prefix you'll see for muscle a lot, or for a muscle cell specifically. Um, the sarcoplasm is enclosed in a special plasma membrane called the sarcolemma. So the sarcolemma is a specialized plasma membrane of a muscle cell. There's also multiple nuclei in each muscle fiber, right? Muscle, skeletal muscle fibers are multinucleated um, and you can see them beneath the sarcolemma. So here's one nucleus, here's another nucleus. The entire sarcolemma is enclosed in endomysium, which if you recall was that loose connective tissue um, protection. Each muscle fiber contains bundles of proteins called myofibrils. So now within each myofiber, there are myofibrils. And within each myofibril, we'll see myofilaments. So myofibrils collectively fill most of the sarcoplasm. So most of the sarcoplasm is dense with myofibrils, which are just bundles of myofilaments. Each myofibril is surrounded by what's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a modified endoplasmic reticulum and also abundant mitochondria. So I'm gonna go back for a second. Um, so right now you should pause and make sure you understand the hierarchy of skeletal muscle um, as far as we've gone so far. So in this picture, you can see the sarcoplasmic reticulum in blue. Right, and we'll see that that's a very important structure in muscle cells. So within each myofibril, we said there are bundles of protein threads called myofilaments, right? So a myofibril is a bundle of protein threads called myofilaments. And there are two types of myofilaments. There are thin myofilaments, which are mostly composed of actin. If you recall, those are um, one of the three cytoskeletal proteins, actin. Um, we also have thin filaments, which are composed mostly of myosin. And myosin is most related to the motor proteins, like kinesin and dynein, that we spoke about um, in an earlier chapter. So myosin, um, again, this is a single myosin molecule. It's a motor protein. It has a head and a tail, just like kinesin and dynein does, but they arrange themselves in thick filaments. So this is a thick filament with multiple myosin heads protruding. This is unlike kinesin or dynein. So we have the thick filament of myosin and a thin filament of actin. And these filaments are arranged in such a way where actin is on either side of myosin. So they're slightly overlapping. And when muscles contract, then you'll see that the actin and myosin fully overlap, but in a relaxed muscle, they are not overlapping. So let's just take a step, uh, pause the video now, um, as I show you each of these slides to make sure you understand what the hierarchy of skeletal muscle looks like. So the answer to this is D. A muscle fiber is labeled. The answer to this is C, 
the epimysium is labeled, that would be B. Uh, the perimysium is labeled, and that would be A, outside of each, right? It, this is tempting to, this is one fascicle, and the blue is the perimysium. That's what's shown here. Okay, so now we could zoom into the myofibril even more and see that it's divided into specific units. And we call these units sarcomeres. A sarcomere is a contractile unit of the muscle cell, of the muscle fiber. So a sarcomere is actually the smallest unit of a muscle that can contract on its own. So it's called the contractile unit of a muscle cell. So each sarcomere can contract and collectively the entire myofibril contains with the myofiber will shorten. And of course, combined over many myofibers, right? That means the entire um, fascicle will contract and shorten. Each sarcomere begins and ends with what's called a Z line or a Z disc. Unfortunately, a lot of these names are inconsistent um, between textbooks and images and the lab manual even is, is different. Um, so you have to be familiar with a couple of different terms. So the Z disc is the same thing as a Z line. And this is one Z disc over here. This is another Z disc over here. And again, these are the borders of the sarcomere. This is one sarcomere. And within the sarcomere, you see an overlapping pattern of thick and thin filaments. So over here in purple, these are all the thin filaments. And these are the thick filaments all over here. This is the myosin. And then you have an area of just thin filaments. And then you have an area of thick filaments. So if you recall under the microscope, or you could see in this image here, there are these striations of light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. So that's because of the, the overlapping and non-overlapping pattern of myofilaments. So this is gonna appear darker and this is gonna appear lighter, then darker, then lighter. So here's again, another way to look at a muscle fiber. We have, this whole thing is a myo, myo, um, sorry, muscle fiber, myofiber, and this is a myofibril. And we said around each myofibril, there's the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is shown in uh, yellow here, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And there are also these unique structures called T-tubules, T-tubules, and these are shown in blue. And a T-tubule is an extension of the sarcolemma. So the sarcolemma is the plasma membrane, and it kind of invaginates inward in these T-tubules. The T-tubules can kind of pass on a message from the sarcolemma to the inside of the muscle fiber as quickly as possible. So they transverse the entire muscle fiber, these T-tubules. And again, this can help communicate with the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a specialized smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is adapted to store and release calcium ions. So these yellow sarcoplasmic reticula are calcium storage sites, especially at these ends. We'll see these terminals are um, where a lot of the calcium is stored. And the sarcolemma can transmit a message from the outside along T-tubules, these transverse tubules. So the sarcolemma can release calcium. And we'll see why that's important soon. Calcium is required for muscle contraction. That's the only thing you have to know for now. So in addition, we said there are multiple nuclei in a muscle fiber, lots of mitochondria, and we need glycogen. So take a second to think about why we need mitochondria and why we need glycogen. So we need glycogen as a glucose source. And we need mitochondria to break the glucose down into 
ATP, as we'll soon see. Um, myoglobin protein, it's similar to hemoglobin, that's different in structure, and myoglobin stores oxygen for the mitochondria. So think about why we need oxygen. And different meats, different types of proteins, different muscles, right? What we eat is the muscle of the animal usually. So different muscle types have different amounts of myoglobin depending on the species and the tissue. So fish, for example, don't rely on myoglobin for respiration to get their ATP. So it looks rather white and pale. Chicken, like chicken breast do, does have some myoglobin in it. And that's why chicken looks kind of pink. And beef, so this looks like a shoulder or something. Like a beef shoulder is heavily involved in physical exercise all the time. So it has lots of this myoglobin that looks red. So when um, it's bound to oxygen, it looks red. And that's what explains why beef is red because it has an abundant of uh, myoglobin protein. And this is what allows oxygen to be delivered to the mitochondria. So the mitochondria could use that oxygen for aerobic respiration to make ATP from glucose. So here's another view of a muscle fiber. You could pause the video now, make sure you're able to label most of these parts. What you can see here in a different view um, is the blue sarcoplasmic reticulum and how it kind of surrounds each and every myofibril. Or this is a myofibril, that's a myofibril. You can see mitochondria surrounding all of them. So there's a constant source of ATP. Um, and I mentioned these terminal cisterns, which are the terminals, the ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that have an abundant um, storage of calcium ions. So those can rapidly deliver them along the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So what is another name for a muscle cell? These are some easier ones. So B, what is the functional unit of a muscle cell or the smallest unit of a muscle that could contract? So the answer is C, sarcomere. Which of the following contains the other three? The answer is C, right? Fascicles contain fibers, which contain fibrils, which contain filaments. So we said that the striations of a muscle cell result from the organization of myosin and actin. And we see this in cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle, but not in smooth muscle. And we have names for these striations. Um, they're alternating bands of dark and light, and we call the dark bands A bands. We could think of A for the A in dark. So the A band is the dark portion that's shown over here. It's the dark portion. That's the A band where I'm outlining here. And the light band is where there's only the myofilament, only the thin filaments. You can think about like the eye in light, an eye looks thin for thin filaments. So the A band is dark. That's where the thick filaments and the thin filaments overlap. In the middle of the A band, there's what's called the H zone or the H band. And that's where they're just um, thick filaments. So this is the H zone in the middle of the A band. Or here's, I got this picture called the H band. But again, the H, you can think about H for heavy. That's where the heavy chains, the thick filaments are just in the middle. Right? It's not as dark as the rest of the A-band because it's just the thick filaments. Whereas the adjacent sides, this part and this part of the A-band is the darkest because you have overlapping thin and thick filaments. And in the middle of the H-band, we have what's called the M-line, the middle 
So again, here's Z disk, Z disk. It goes Z disk, then I band. This is the I band. It's where thin filaments are only, right? And this Z disk is what provides the anchorage for the thin filaments. So the Z disk holds on to these thin filaments. And, oops, sorry. And then we have the beginning of the A band of overlapping thin and thick filaments. Um, I should also mention there are some elastic filaments that hold the myosin together. So in green, there, these are elastic filaments um, that anchor the myosin to the Z-disc. Right, they're not just floating in the middle. Um, and then we have the part of the A band. Then we have the H zone or the H band, which is just the thin filaments. We have the other part of the A band, which has both overlapping thin and thick filaments. And then we have the I band again, with just the thin filaments and elastic filaments, and then Z disc. That is one sarcomere. This is a great image that compares an actual histograph with the cartoon we just saw. So you might be able, uh, might be asked to label this on an exam or practical. Right, this is the entire, so note how this is all color coded and let's start over here. This is one Z disc and this is the other Z disc. So this is one sarcomere. And what you're looking at is the longitudinal section. You're looking at individual myofibrils. So this is one myofibril. This is another myofibril. This is another myofibril, myofibril number four, myofibril number five. So those are the myofibrils that are each divided into sarcomeres. And we know that each sarcomere is bordered by the Z disc. Then there's a region where it's just light. That's the I band, right? That's the I band of an adjacent uh, sarcomere, I band. And then after the I band, we have this A band, right? Again, the A band has overlapping thin and thick filaments. There's a kind of small H zone or the H band with the absence of thin filaments. And the M line is directly in the middle. And then the pattern repeats, right? So you go after the midline, you have a little bit of H. Then you have the A band, then you have the I band, and then you have the other Z disc. So make sure that makes sense. So now we can begin talking about the complicated process of muscle contraction. And to produce the muscle contraction, what we're gonna see is that actin and myosin kind of grab onto each other and they pull the Z discs of the sarcomere closer together. That's the best way I could try to explain it. So in a relaxed muscle, we see that the Z discs are maximally apart. And what we're gonna see in the fully contracted muscle down here is that we're gonna bring the Z discs closer together. So we're gonna shorten the muscle. And that's what contraction is, remember. We're pulling, we're shortening. And when we shorten the muscle, that can pull on a tendon, right? Which can grab a bone to produce an action. So all we're doing in muscle contraction is using proteins to shorten cells, which could then pull on a bone to produce an action, right? When you pull, that will shorten the sarcomere as the myofilaments slide past each other. And the Z discs are linked to the sarcolemma, to the muscle's um, plasma membrane. So the entire muscle cell will shorten as the Z discs are pulled together and summed up over many, many sarcomeres and many myofibrils, this pulling action of the myofilaments produces force as the muscle cell contracts. This is a very helpful image you should refer to often to see how the sarcomere shortens. And you'll see how, I'm gonna, I don't wanna give away too much information just yet, but note this slide is an important one to go back to. Actually, let me just explain it now. 
So we noted the Z-discs are at the border of each sarcomere. And you can see that the H zone is very large over here, right? You have a, a region where there's just thick filaments. There's no overlap here. As the muscle starts to contract, we're going to see that the actin filaments here shown in purple are going to move closer to each other, right? And the sarcomere will then shorten as the Z discs move closer together. So we're going to see a narrow H zone. The H zone gets narrower and narrower. So does the I band, right? The I band gets narrower as the sarcomere shortens. The A band does not narrow overall, right? The A band always stays the same side, the only stay um, the same size. At a fully maximized, fully contracted muscle, you have no H zone anymore. You have full overlap of thin and thick filaments. The I band is very narrow as well. So you don't see as um, large the striations. You'll see a small light band because there's no um, area where it's just thin filaments anymore. So make sure you review this. In a relaxed muscle, actin and myosin myofilaments lie side by side, and the H zones and I band are at maximum width. During contraction, the actin and myosin myofilaments interact. The actins are pulled toward the center of each myosin myofilament. As a result, the sarcomeres shorten. In the fully contracted muscle, the ends of the actin myofilaments overlap, the H zones disappear, and the I band becomes very narrow. Great. So I like that video a lot. Um, make sure you watch it as many times as possible um, in the video, in the uh, PowerPoint. So how do muscles get the message to contract? It turns out that a skeletal muscle fiber must be stimulated by a nerve impulse in order to contract. And a motor neuron is the specific type of neuron that can send that nerve impulse to muscle cells in order to tell them to contract. So each skeletal muscle fiber is innervated and controlled by a somatic motor neuron. So here are muscle fibers, the muscle cells. Each cell is stimulated by motor neurons. And motor neurons could come from the spinal cord or the brain. And one motor neuron does not just talk to one muscle fiber. So one motor neuron innervates more than one muscle fiber. And the motor neuron plus the muscle fibers, the muscle fibers it innervates is called a motor unit, a motor unit. So this is a motor unit. Each of these is a motor unit when it, a muscle is con contacted by a motor neuron. So a motor neuron plus the muscle fibers it innervates is called a motor unit. And different types of muscles will have different numbers of um, motor units and muscle fibers. So think about the eye, something that's very precise. A muscle fiber, um, a motor neuron in the eye is going to have motor neurons only interacting with, let's say, three muscle fibers at a time. You'll have one motor neuron interacting with only three muscle fibers because you need very fine, delicate movements of the eye. When you're trying to control the eye, um, eye and vision, compare that to the legs or something. If you need a lot of strength in the quadriceps, then you can have a motor neuron containing hundreds to thousands of different muscle fibers. Meaning, in response to stimulation from just one motor neuron, you could stimulate up to a thousand muscle fibers at once. So, when you want strength, um, a motor unit contains a lot of different muscle fibers. If you want precise control, you have much fewer muscle fibers per motor unit. Right, so as an example, uh, there are about a thousand muscle fibers per motor unit in the calf, which is the strongest muscle or the second strongest muscle. 
How do nerves send signals to muscles? Well, this is the whole premise of muscle contraction. Muscle fibers and neurons are both electrically excitable. So both could be stimulated um, by electricity. And this is largely due to their membranes because they have um, special proteins on their membrane that change voltage, right? They can allow voltage changes in the cell in response to stimulation. So proteins on the membrane can be stimulated and therefore change the voltage of muscle fibers um, in response to nerve, uh, neuron stimulation. So ions inside the cell normally maintain a negative charge, right? We know that um, the negative charge is crucial for all cells. And ions can also have an effect on protein shape, on protein conformation and activity. So this becomes important. The resting membrane potential, so normally when a skeletal muscle is non-contracting, is about negative 90 millivolts. So that's the negative uh, charge. It's not, negative 90 millivolts is normally um, the resting membrane potential of a muscle cell. So at rest, a muscle cell has a negative charge of negative 90 millivolts. And this negative charge is maintained by our friend, the sodium potassium pump, right? If you remember the sodium potassium pump, what kind of transport does that do? Active transport. Right? It wants to make sure that there's a constant negative charge inside, that there's very, very little sodium inside and a lot of potassium inside the cell right? in order to maintain resting membrane potential. So in order to see how a muscle cell is stimulated, we have to zoom in to the neuromuscular junction or an NMJ. And at a neuromuscular junction, it's where a motor neuron shown here contacts the muscle fiber. So one nerve or one neuron contacts the muscle fiber at multiple different locations along the sarcolemma. So multiple receptors can be activated at once. And we're going to go through this step by step. So here is our motor neuron. And at the end of the motor neuron, we have what's called a synapse. This is a space. So there's a space between the end of the motor neuron and the start of the sarcolemma. So this is specifically called the synaptic cleft, this space at the synapse. So the step one, this motor neuron is about to send a message. It's stimulated by the brain. So, or something, right? The brain is, or uh, the spinal cord in the case of a reflex. And this stimulated motor neuron will release acetylcholine, acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. So, these are little dots or acetylcholine that are released into the synaptic cleft, the space in between the motor neuron and the um, skeletal muscle fiber. Step two, here we are again. Um, uh, this is the motor neuron. Specifically, this is an axon, right? Sending the message away. And here we can see that the released acetylcholine is attaching to acetylcholine receptors that are shown in light blue here, right? This is the acetylcholine receptor. So acetylcholine is binding to its receptor on the sarcolemma of the muscle cell. And that sends an action potential, an action potential down the length of the muscle cell, down those transverse tubules, those T tubules. So again, acetylcholine is released from the neuron that binds to the acetylcholine receptors on the sarcolemma of the muscle cell. That creates an action potential that is sent along the sarcolemma and down the T tubules into the muscle cell. This action potential will then trigger calcium release, right? That's the third step. Calcium can then be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum once the action potential is transmitted along the muscle fiber. And we said that calcium is required for contraction. So pause here and make sure you can understand step one, two, and three.
before we move forward. So normally in a resting cell, we said that there's a negative um, charge on the inside of the membrane because there are more negatively charged particles. And the plasma membrane is polarized. Polarized means charged, right? With a negative resting membrane potential of negative 90. We said there is an abundance of sodium ions on the outside, and there is an excess abundance of potassium ions on the inside. What happens when a neuron is going to stimulate a muscle cell is we're going to mix all this up. This is going to get all switched around. So resting membrane potential will be disturbed by an action potential. So when acetylcholine binds to a receptor on the sarcolemma of a muscle cell, the first thing that happens is that sodium ions can flow inside of the sarcolemma. They, so sodium ions can come inside of the muscle cell. Um, that happens because there are gated uh, sodium channels. Acetylcholine binds to the receptor, and what's actually happening is sodium is being allowed inside, inside of the cell. So sodium is going to flow into the cell down its electrochemical gradient, meaning it's going from where it's abundant outside of the cell to where it's not abundant inside of the cell. So finally, sodium can go from high to low inside of the muscle cell. And that is called depolarization. Remember, polarized means like negatively charged. So you're depolarizing it. You're making it not negative anymore because all those positive sodium ions are flooding inside of the sarcolemma. So this is the second, this is the, um, the depolarization phase. And that's what marks an action potential. This whole up and down in charge is called an action potential. So the first part of the action potential is depolarization when sodium floods inside and the plasma membrane becomes positively charged. And immediately what happens is the sodium gates close and potassium gates open. So then potassium starts rushing out of the cell. And that's called repolarization because the loss of all those positive potassium ions turns the membrane negative again. So potassium is leaving and leaving. The inside is then negative and negative and more negative. So much so there's actually a part that is more negative than it even began. So it's, there's a little hyperpolarization. But that quick up and down voltage shift, that depolarization and repolarization is called an action potential. So cells we said are normally at resting membrane potential, whereas an action potential is a quick event when stimulated by a motor neuron. And the action potential can perpetuate itself down the length of a cell's membrane. So when an action potential happens at one point, it causes an action potential immediately adjacent to it. And this wave of excitation is called an impulse. So this is an impulse that's sent along by the T-tubules of the sarcolemma to the interior of the muscle fiber. So when a muscle fiber is stimulated at one place in the sarcolemma, that, mem that action potential is transmitted along the sarcolemma down into the T-tubules so you can have the entire muscle stimulated at once to contract. So let's take it a step um, further in a little more detail now. So I presented um, this slide before in very little detail. So let's go back and we see step one is in response to a signal from the brain or something. We have the motor neuron release acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors. Um, that allows sodium to flood inside of the cell. And that is an action potential. And that action potential can be propagated along the T tubules to go inside of the cell which will trigger calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So why do we need calcium? Right now we have to take it a step further. Why do we need calcium? Why is calcium release in step three so important for muscle contraction? So it turns out that when the signal um, from neurons 
trigger the release of internal, internal calcium ions, that allows myosin to interact with actin. Remember that muscle contraction is nothing more than myosin pulling onto actin, thus shortening the sarcomeres. But we need calcium in order for myosin to be able to interact with actin. So we said before that muscle cells um, keep all of their calcium ions in their sarcoplasmic reticula, their mod modified ERs. So here is a look at a muscle cell. And in blue, you see the T-tubules that are extensions of the sarcolemma. So as an action potential is, let's say um, a motor neuron hits over here. As that motor neuron stimulates um, acetylcholine receptors over here, that action potential, once sodium starts flooding in to this area, that stimulates an adjacent action potential and then another action potential. And then these T-tubules could bring the action potential down inside to these myofibrils over here. And we said what these action potentials do is open up these uh, calcium storage sites in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So what we're doing is we're taking a motor neuron, we're activating all of these um, acetylcholine receptors that send action potentials, which are gonna allow calcium to be released so then myosin and actin can interact and the muscle can shorten. So there are two proteins that get in the way of myosin and actin interacting. So these guys are interfering, troponin and tropomyosin. So here's actin in yellow and there's the part that a myosin has to attach to is blocked by this tropomyosin. And troponin or troponin sometimes keeps the tropomyosin in place. So again, troponin and tropomyosin keep um, myosin from e interacting with actin. So there's no muscle contraction allowed when tropomyosin and troponin are um, normally in their normal spot. Finally, when calcium is released, Calcium combined to troponin and thus move tropomyosin away to expose the binding site on actin. Therefore, myosin can grab onto that actin and pull for muscle contraction. So normally actin cannot pull on myosin because troponin and tropomyosin are in the way. When calcium is present, that causes a conformational change. It causes a shape change in troponin and tropomyosin. So the myosin can grab onto actin and pull to shorten the sarcomere. This whole situation is called the sliding filament model of muscle contraction. So we're gonna go again step-by-step. Step. Um, we're gonna start with the motor neuron. Um, and a motor neuron will send along a nerve impulse at a neuromuscular junction. That nerve impulse is propagated along the sarcolemma and also spread along the T-tubules, right? This is a T-tubule over here, this little tube. That T-tubule will cause, sarco um, cause the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium um, the calcium ions then exit the sarcoplasmic reticulum and go into the sarcoplasm. Remember, the sarcoplasm is where there are the myofilaments, right? The myofilaments, this is, these are the myofilaments within a myofibril. And once calcium is released, that can bind to the troponin that normally blocks the actin. So myosin can interact with actin now. And in step four, once the actin molecules are exposed, the heads of the myosin myofilaments can then bind to them and form what are called cross bridges. Th those attachments are called cross bridges and they can then pull on that actin to shorten the entire sarcomere. So maybe this is a good time to pause and review everything we've gone through so far. So now let's talk about ATP. We know ATP is required for muscle contraction. 
And it's ATP that provides the energy because ATP charges the myosin so that it can grab onto actin. ATP provides the energy so that myosin can pull onto actin. All right, so the energy produces the pulling action where myosin attaches and pulls on actin, which overall shortens the sarcomere. So once ATP charges the myosin, the myosin breaks down the ATP into ADP and phosphate. And I'd like you to watch this video first to get your brain acquainted to what we're about to see and refer to this video often. Myofilaments are composed of strings of the proteins actin and myosin. An actin filament has two strands of actin molecules wrapped together. A myosin filament has many myosin proteins packed together, and each myosin protein has a globular head region that protrudes from the filament. Myofilaments can contract or shorten due to interactions between the myosin heads and the actin filaments. Contraction begins with the head of myosin molecules bound to actin on the actin filament. While still bound to actin, the myosin head flexes, pulling the actin filament along with it. This causes the actin filament to slide by the myosin filament. Then the myosin head releases from the actin and unflexes, a change that is powered by ATP. This frees the myosin head to bind with a different actin molecule farther up the actin filament. The entire process may then be repeated many times. The myosin, in effect, walks along the actin filament, moving the actin filament more each time. So what we're looking at is going to be a step-by-step -step process of what we just saw. So here, this is where nothing is formed. There's no attachment. Um, so first step is calcium has to bind to troponin and tropomyosin, allowing them to move out of the way. And now this is an activated myosin. This is one that hydrolyzed ATP into ADP and phosphate. So this is activated and this can grab onto the actin and form a cross bridge. The phosphate and ATP and ADP is then released. And then what it does is called the power stroke. So the energy stored in the myosin head from that ATP is used to move, right? To move the myosin head and pull the um, thin filament, pull that purple actin toward the middle, toward the end line. So again, this is where we are right here. We're looking at just one myosin head interacting with this one um, thin filament. So once it pulls, then it can release. And now once it's released, we need to charge it again. So another ATP has to come in, causing it to detach. So when ADP is released, it's kind of in a stuck position. And then we need another ATP to attach to activate it have it detach and then go back so that's charged for another um, cross bridge formation. So it goes ATP attaches, that causes it to detach. Right when ATP comes to the myosin, it detaches from the um, from the actin. Once the phosphate leaves, it could form the cross bridge and it pulls. Then another ATP comes in that detaches it and causes it to be cocked backward. And then again, it can do another cross bridge once it gets broken down into ADP and phosphate. Then it does another pull. And this whole cycle has to happen many times during muscle contraction. So we're going to go through this again, but in a single muscle contraction, myosin and actin go through many different cycles of grabbing, pulling, then releasing, grabbing, pulling, releasing. And each pull from myosin requires energy from a fresh ATP molecule. 
So the chemical energy of ATP is converted into the mechanical work of the muscle. And this is sometimes referred to excitation contraction coupling. So the excitation of ATP is coupled to muscle contraction. And when nerve stimulation stops, there's a special enzyme in the synaptic cleft of the um, neuromuscular junction called acetylcholinesterase. And acetylcholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine so it can no longer um, allow depolarization of the muscle cell. That will allow, if there's no more action potential, that means calcium will not be released. So the calcium will be reabsorbed back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the absence of calcium would prevent myosin and actin from grabbing onto each other because troponin would go back in the way. That would allow muscles to relax. So let's watch this other video. During contraction of a muscle, calcium ions bind to troponin. This moves tropomyosin out of the way and uncovers binding sites for myosin on the actin myofilaments. ADP and phosphate are attached to the myosin head from the previous cycle of movement. The myosin heads attach to the exposed binding sites on the actin myofilaments to form cross bridges and the phosphate is released. Energy stored in the head of the myosin myofilament is used to move the head. This causes the actin myofilament to slide past the myosin myofilament. The ADP is released from the myosin head as it moves. The bond between actin and the myosin head is broken when an ATP molecule binds to the myosin head. The ATP is broken down to ADP and phosphate, releasing energy, which is stored in the myosin head and will be used later for movement. The head of the myosin molecule returns to its upright position and is ready to bind to actin again. If calcium ions are still present, the entire sequence is repeated. So you might want to watch that a few times just to get into the whole habit of how this works step by step, right? So first you have ATP already got hydrolyzed into ADP and phosphate. Now it can form cross bridges and pull. Notice where we are up here. Then an ATP can come in and that ATP will allow it to be detached and then it can go spring back for the next pull. Right? And as long as calcium is still present, meaning the actin binding sites, um, the myosin binding sites on actin are still exposed, we could then pull again. So now I'm going to go through a step-by-step -step overview um, with the most amount of detail. So here we are at a neuromuscular junction. Here's a nerve signal that's arriving along the motor nerve fiber. What that actually does is it allows calcium, again, this is a step that I did not talk about yet, but in response to the nerve signal, calcium enters the terminal. It opens voltage-gated calcium channels, right? So the voltage change opens up channels in the nerve right in the nerve um, in the neuron and that allows calcium to enter and once calcium is here that is what tells the acetylcholine to be released so step one is the nerve signal arrives and at this terminal at the axon terminal there are special proteins special membrane proteins that can detect the change in electricity it can detect the nerve signal the depolarization and it will open calcium ion uh, calcium um, channels that detect the change in voltage and calcium will start flooding inside of the neuron right if specifically in the axon terminal so now we have calcium in the axon terminal in response to a nerve signal when there's a lot of calcium that will stimulate synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft 
of the neuromuscular junction. So by exocytosis, the acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft. There's an abundance of acetylcholine receptors along the synaptic cleft. And acetylcholine receptors are special ligand-gated um, channels that allow sodium or potassium in or out. So as, so, um, as the acetylcholine diffused along the synaptic cleft, it will bind to its receptor on the sarcolemma, which remind, uh, remember is the muscle fiber um, plasma membrane. So acetylcholine mo molecules bind to each receptor and open the channels up. And like I mentioned briefly, these channels are ligand gated ion channels, meaning they're gated ligand gated acetylcholine is the ligand that has to bind to this receptor to open up therefore allowing different ions to go in or out so specifically when the acetylcholine binds to its receptor sodium flows quickly inside of the cell right that's depolarization right this and then we know that the next part is that um, so that could allow other channels to open up, right? The opening of voltage-regulated uh, voltage ion channels allows even more sodium inside. And then after full depolarization, we have other potassium channels open up that allow for repolarization, right? Where all the potassium gets pumped out. So in response, to the first um, acetylcholine receptors allowing a little bit of sodium in, that stimulates more sodium channels along the cell to be opened up to allow full depolarization of the motor neuron. And those ion movements are what create the action potential. That's what excites the muscle. That's what allows the message to be sent along the T tubules so this message, again, it allows sodium inside over here, it depolarized, that act, that's what an action potential is. It's just sodium and potassium changing their position. There's a voltage change. So that voltage change will be propagated along the T-tubules. So it started over here at the neuromuscular junction, but that action potential will be propagated along the entire sarcolemma and down the T-tubules which go down into the cell's interior. And those action potentials open voltage-gated ion channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So again, that the, there are special calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum that detect a change in voltage. So they detect that action potential. And when they detect that action potential, the calcium channels open and they go out into the sarcoplasm. They go inside of the cytosol, which is where all those myofilaments are, the myofibrils. So in blue are the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then the T-tubule sent that signal to release all the calcium inside of the cell. We know that calcium can then bind to the troponin that's usually blocking the um, active sites. And once that happens, the troponin and tropomyosin complex can change shape and make actin available for myosin to bind. So myosin will have ATP bound and hydrolyze it, which activates it. And then it goes into what's called the cocked position. So it goes all the way back and it's high energy position. Now, the cocked myosin could then make a cross bridge, right, with um, the actin. So once it has an ATP, it can go back and like a spring and grab on to the site on the actin. That's forming the cross bridge. The phosphate will be released. And basically what will happen is it will detach when another ATP comes in. So here's where the ADP and the phosphate is lost. It's still attached. 
right? This is where you actually get the start. This is the first pull, right? You're pulling along. And once you pull, you need another ATP to come in to break the cross bridge and have um, this make another um, step back. So this recocks, this myosin kind of takes another step back with ATP and turns it into ADP and phosphate. So it could then grab onto the next actin. So it's every, every time an ATP binds to a myosin, it kind of just goes back and it pulls, right? It grabs and pulls. Then another ATP comes in and releases it. Then it grabs and pulls. Then another ATP comes and releases it. Then it grabs and pulls. So it's step by step. So the binding of a new ATP to myosin can break the cross bridge. Then the myosin will hydrolyze that new ATP, return to its previous state, and then attach to a new active site farther down the thin filament. And at the end of nerve stimulation, right, there's no more signal being sent. There's no more calcium. Um, that means there's no more acetylcholine going to be released. And acetylcholine esterase, this enzyme in the synaptic cleft, will break down any leftover acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. If there's no more action potential, that means all the calcium will be reabsorbed in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. No more calcium will be released. That means that the calcium will be removed from the troponin. Right? So therefore, tropomyosin will block the active site of actin and muscle will not be able to contract because actin cannot bind to myosin anymore. So that's a lot. And to review all of that, I'm going to assign an activity at this website. Um, I hope it works. If the link does not work, um, let me know. But this walks you through a step-by-step -step guide of everything we spoke about. And it's a great interactive exercise to make sure you understand everything spoken about so far. So now is a good time to take a break um, before we move on to part two. So now we could talk about a little bit um, how muscles get their energy. We said that they, of course, need ATP. And now we know why they need ATP, right, for the myosin um, to grab on to actin with the power stroke. Um, but how do we get ATP, right? What do muscles need to contract? ATP, but how do they get it? We know that cell respiration in mitochondria um, is what generates energy, right? Generates ATP from the breakdown of glucose and other biomolecules. So cellular respiration in the mitochondria um, is what makes ATP. And oxygen is required to do this. The, the maximum amount of ATP is made during aerobic cellular respiration. Aerobic implies the requirement of oxygen. So muscles generate the most ATP when oxygen is present, uh, when the mitochondria can do aerobic respiration and break down glucose into ATP. So um, ATP, um, we said, is required for muscles, muscle contraction, and we get the most from aerobic respiration. And muscles have abundant myoglobin proteins that store excess oxygen and transfer them to the mitochondria whenever they're needed. And so oxygen from hemoglobin in the blood or from myoglobin in the muscle fibers um, gets delivered to the mitochondria. In addition, pyruvic acid, which is a, a product from glucose, broken down uh, from glycolysis in the cytoplasm, or fatty acids or amino acids. So all these are biomolecules, whether they're from fats, proteins, or carbs, those building blocks all feed into the mitochondria with oxygen um, from myoglobin or hemoglobin, and the mitochondria will convert all of that into ATP as the biggest product, and also as waste products, CO2, H2O, and heat. So that's aerobic respiration, right? We use oxygen that's aerobic to break down biomolecules to convert them into ATP we get H2O, CO2, and heat as byproducts. And 
Aerobic respiration is employed during inactivity. So right now you're using aerobic respiration, assuming you're not on the treadmill or light to moderate activity. So when we have oxygen readily available from myoglobin, as we breathe in and out, our muscles are storing oxygen in, in myoglobin, right? So the hemoglobin can pass off the oxygen from um, the blood to muscles. So the myoglobin can hold on to oxygen. And as we need it, as we need the oxygen to make ATP, um, the myoglobin will deliver that oxygen to the mitochondria. So this is when oxygen is readily available. So normally at rest, we're using our um, oxygen from myoglobin. After a sprint, once we need long-term energy, we then need to use our cardiopulmonary systems, meaning we need our heart rate to um, increase so we can get more blood um, oxygenated. We need to increase our respiration, right? So we can maximally oxygenate all of the blood and get it delivered uh, as many places as possible, as quickly as possible. So once we uh, kick up our cardiopulmonary systems, then aerobic respiration can continue. Uh, but we have this, um, middle point. So after 10 minutes, we can then resume producing our ATP aerobically, right? And first the energy comes from glucose and carbs, but later on fatty acids become the more significant fuel source. But what happens in between? So when ATP is depleted, we can actually use different fuel molecules to regenerate ATP. So there's a trade-off though. We're gonna see that there's a speed versus efficiency trade-off in order to fuel muscle contraction. So normally when there's excess ATP, muscles transfer the high energy phosphate from ATP to a molecule called creatine. And creatine is like an uncharged battery. And when phosphate is added to creatine, we get creatine phosphate. And creatine phosphate is like a charged battery. It's like a portable charged battery. So this is part of the phosphagen system is getting creatine phosphate. And creatine phosphate is a storage form of readily available energy. In our muscle cells, we have five times more creatine phosphate than ATP. So our muscle cells at rest have an abundance of creatine phosphate. They're ready to go batteries to fuel our energy. So again, in relaxed muscle, ATP is broken down into ADP to make creatine into creatine phosphate. When energy levels, um, when ATP levels decrease, when we first start muscle contraction and we use up our ATP that's stored in the muscle, automatically the creatine phosphate is used, right? This creatine phosphate is used to convert ADP into more ATP. So we could then have more ATP for the muscle to contract. So in contracting muscle, creatine phosphate phosphorylates ADP into ATP. So we can then use that energy for muscle contraction. However, this creatine phosphate is depleted very quickly um, in rapidly contracting muscles. So you get about 10 seconds of new ATP being formed from the creatine phosphate, but then we don't have any more creatine phosphate to recharge the ATP. And we're also running out of oxygen in our myoglobin to do more aerobic respiration. So we have a problem, uh, but there's a solution. And the solution is anaerobic respiration. So during periods of strenuous activity, when we don't have enough oxygen, we can do anaerobic respiration. So this is when oxygen is insufficiently delivered to the muscle fibers. So we could use glucose from our muscle glycogen. Remember glycogen is the polysaccharide form of glucose. And so muscle glycogen can be broken down into glucose or glucose from the blood can also be broken down by glycolysis into two ATPs and two lactic acid molecules. So it gets broken down into two lactic acid molecules and gives us only two ATP. That's not that great. 
right? We get two ATPs from a glucose compared to about 32 to 36 ATPs um, with aerobic respiration. So this lactic acid um, is then delivered into the blood, which can be metabolized by muscle cells, nerve cells, and liver cells to produce ATP. Um, but we need oxygen to metabolize this lactic acid as well. So oftentimes you might feel a burn, but when you, sh when you use um, a muscle continuously, right, you're going to feel muscle soreness or muscle fatigue. And that's the lactic acid that's forming, that's accumulating because your muscles lost their, used up all their oxygen and had to resort to anaerobic respiration to break down stored glucose into lactic acid to get that ATP. So when your muscles um, are very, they're burning and they're sore, that's telling you you're doing anaerobic respiration because your muscle doesn't have enough oxygen. So once you take a breath and you catch your breath and deliver enough oxygen, right? When your pulmonary system can catch up, then the burn will um, dissipate because then you'll get enough ATP to resume aerobic respiration. All right, so this is when we start to catch our breath and we can use that oxygen to metabolize um, the lactic acid. And we'll talk more about that in a slide. Um, but for now, let's just talk about that trade-off, right? The fastest storage to produce ATP, fastest way to get ATP was the creatine phosphate phosphagen system, but it's the least efficient. It lasts like 10 seconds. Then anaerobic glycolysis, right? Um, not that great because it only gives us two ATPs, right? So it's not that efficient, but it happens pretty fast. Then we can do aerobic respiration once our cardio and pulmonary systems um, get back in check to compensate for our increased activity. And we can break down glucose and carbs to get some ATP, but that takes some time, right? We have to wait until our heart and our lungs catch up. And finally, when we use up our carbs and our glucose, we can start breaking down fats and fatty acids for energy. And we actually get the most ATP from fats but it takes the longest time to do it. So this is the speed versus efficiency trade-off. So I like this picture in the book. This talks about the mode of ATP synthesis along a sprint. So you start off at resting state, you're ready, and you're using eight, um, aerobic respiration, using oxygen stored in your myoglobin and your tissues. So you have the maximum, red means maximum amount of ATP. You're ready to go. You then quickly, you start running and you quickly use all your ATP within a second. But luckily you have five times as much creatine phosphate stored. So you could then regenerate some ATP by creatine phosphate phosphorylating ADP. So the phosphagen system kicks in and then within 10 seconds, you're making more ATP again. But then you have a problem. You use up your ATP you use up all of your creatine phosphate and you have no more oxygen. So now what do you do? Luckily, we can use the glycogen and lactic acid system of anaerobic respiration, right? And then we can start making more and more ATP. Finally, we're gonna allow enough time for our heart to start beating faster and our lungs to start breathing deeper. And that will then support aerobic respiration because the cardiopulmonary function resumed. And this is why we need what's called EPOC or excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. So at the end of a exercise, right, we have what's called an oxygen debt, right? We have a lot of needs for oxygen, but we're in debt now because we use so much of it. So EPOC is defined as the difference between the oxygen consumption after exercise between the normal resting state. So you have a negative, you have a debt of oxygen because you need to compensate, right, for what you used up. So we need EPOC to replenish the ATP using cellular respiration. So we need to use that oxygen for the mitochondria to be able to make more ATP. Some of that ATP will then help regenerate creatine phosphate in the phosphagen system. We also need to replenish all of the oxygen reserves on myoglobin. So when we catch our breath, then our myoglobin can grab onto oxygen and hold onto it for the next um, time we need it. 
like I mentioned before, we need to metabolize lactic acid. So oxygen is required for the uh, metabolism of lactic acid so it doesn't accumulate in our tissues. And finally, a lot of our cells after exercise have more needs. They need more um, oxygen so they could elevate their metabolic rate and break down more nutrients, right? They need to compensate. They need to replenish themselves. So they need more oxygen just for their basic metabolic needs. They need to recover after being used. And EPOC can be six times the basal oxygen consumption and last up to an hour. So after you work out, your body might be working very, very hard um, to meet um, the metabolic demand known as oxygen debt. So muscles sense and adapt to the demands of exercise and muscles that are used more will tend to grow stronger, larger and increase their endurance. So hypertrophy, hypertrophy is an increase in muscle fiber size and strength. So what happens when we lift weights, for example, is certain types of exercise cause micro damage to the myofilaments. And when the micro damage is repaired, the myofilaments, myofilaments are rebuilt slightly stronger than before. And this is an oversimplification, but hypertrophy can be the increase in myofibrils. The so myofibular growth is one form of hypertrophy. Muscles can also increase their mitochondria as you work out, grow more blood capillaries, and produce more enzymes to break down metabolic fuels. So the more you use a muscle, the more it'll be functional, right? The more you use it, the more it will, it will adapt to your demands. And vice versa, muscles that are not used will decrease in size and strength. So atrophy is a decrease in muscle fiber size and strength. So use it or lose it. And exercise improves the ability for muscles to use both carbs and fats for fuels. So it's more flexibility. Um, you can switch between the different types of fuels more easily. And you dispose of carbohydrates with less total insulin secreted. So normally we need insulin to help get carbohydrates and glucose out of our blood. And when you work out, you improve your ability to use less insulin to get your glucose inside of your cells and out of your blood. And a good question is what kind of exercise is the best exercise? And that's a very open-ended question. So the best exercise is the one that you're going to actually do because when you enjoy it and you're consistent, that's when you'll be successful. And here are some slides about exercise that won't be on the exam. Um, if you're interested, you can go through these. Um, talks about resistance exercise versus endurance exercise and cross training, which is a combo of both. Um, here's a little talk about um, DMD, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which is when one protein called dystrophin, which normally links the thin filaments to the sarcolemma, is broken. So think about why that would be really important. If these sarcomeres shorten, that's not gonna do anything to the muscle if there's no attachment, right? So normally when the sarcomere shortens, it pulls on the dystrophin, so the entire sarcolemma, the entire muscle can shorten. But when you have DMD, um, which affects one in 5,000 males, you get a disintegration of the muscle fibers because they're not used. So very early in age, um, you could detect the mutant gene for dystrophin, and you see muscle weakness in very early stages, but then you get progressive weakness in cardiac muscle and smooth muscle, which can be fatal. Um, here's another example of a muscular disorder, fibromyalgia, and a little bit about strains and sprains. So that's the end of chapter 11. And finally, the, the last recorded lecture for this unit will be a review of the musculoskeletal system. So that's going to be a lot of detail. So combined with the chapter 10 and this chapter 11 recording, this the final upcoming lecture will be the entire muscular system. So I hope um, that made sense. Email me with any questions and I'll see you for the final part of the musculoskeletal system.